Great, thank you, Richard Chan. And uh, Mike, thanks for those opening comments. I'm going to talk about one of the maps that Tony just showed, uh, which was the second map that showed the enormous diversity of emerging infectious diseases that have come up over the course of his career over the last 30 years. And what we need to understand is that virtually all of those agents that showed up on those maps, they pre-existed in wildlife on this planet before they made it in to us. We live in an ecosystem where the interface in between wildlife, livestock, and people is such an incredibly dynamic process that a deep reservoir of an extraordinarily diverse pool of viruses that have been resident in uh, wildlife forever are now the dynamics are changing. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about that relationship between zoonotic diseases, those diseases that um, have their genesis in wildlife spilling over into people. And I would also like just to pick up on AMR, that it is not a zoonotic disease, but what we also know about AMR is that the drivers behind AMR are not simply the events that occur within prescriber user practices within clinical settings. That 90% of all antibiotics consumed within the United States by weight are done within livestock. So as we think about how we protect and preserve sort of the well-being of our population, we need to understand that it's not just about humans or homo sapiens. It's about how we sit within the larger ecology on this planet. So there are five points I'd like to make. First off, even as we talk about zoonosis, it is nothing new. All of those diseases that we see spilling out over the last 30 years is not a new dynamic that, in fact, many of the infectious diseases that are part of the global burden today had their genesis in wildlife. Malaria, tuberculosis, and as uh, Mike just pointed out, HIV. And it's worth noting that while we're here uh, remembering the 100th anniversary of the uh, great pandemic of 1918, in another two to four years, it'll be the 100th anniversary of the spillover of the uh, progenitor virus from simian populations and people that unleashed HIV in the world. And so we live in a place where zoonosis is a very much part of our normal landscape, point one. But point two is that it's not a steady state. The dynamics of emergence, spillover, spread within human populations today is radically different in the 21st century than in any other point. Someone mentioned earlier today that if we were here in Boston 100 years ago, the world's population was 1.5 billion people. Think about it as a species. It took us 400,000 years, plus or minus, to get to that 1 billion mark. In the space of 100 years, we've added another 6 billion people. And by the time we get to the end of this century, we'll add on another five. You can't have that kind of accelerated footprint on this planet without having a hugely disruptive effect on that ecosystem dynamic with wildlife, livestock, and people. So we live in a different space. And as we think about the 21st century, this is a period of great epidemiologic transition driven by population pressures that will play themselves out in ways both at the pandemic but at the epidemic level as well. That said, as we look to the 21st century as a place of extraordinarily dynamic risk, it's safe to say we are not prepared. We remain ill-prepared. Despite extraordinary efforts over the last decade to build systems and capacities around the world to deal with preventing, detecting, and responding, the truth of the matter is we're ultimately held hostage to the fact that our toolbox of response is an enormously inadequate one. And Tony sort of touched upon it when he spoke to the challenges we have in terms of developing countermeasures in the midst of an event. And while he talked about influenza in 2009, it's worth noting that 
by the end of 2009, we may have had enough to provide maximum protection for the American population. But 12 months after the emergence of H1N1, the total amount of vaccine that had been produced worldwide would have protected 17% of the world's population. Two billion people by that time had been infected. There's, an, there's a dislink between what we're capable of doing in terms of developing countermeasures after emergence towards having maximum impact, not just on the people within the United States, but the global community, those 7.6 <coughs> billion people that live on this planet. Why are we still so ill-prepared? Why is that toolbox so fragile? And I go to the last point on, um, again, Tony's slide, where he talked about vaccine strategy. And he talked about the prototype strategy, which is not to simply look within the Flavy viruses at developing a vaccine against Zika or yellow fever um, or uh, Dengue, which we know do not cross-react with each other. It's beginning to rethink what we know about the relationships within those viral families and use broad data um, analysis across families to be able to think about broad-spectrum countermeasures for the first time. But the weak link in that strategy is that for the six or so examples that he put up there for the Flavy virus, we know that there's somewhere on the order of 6,000 other flavy viruses circulating in wildlife. Same thing for um, filoviruses, Ebola's. Same thing for retroviruses. We live in a world where the pool of viruses which are circulating that we will become increasingly more acquainted with in the 21st century. We've only seen 0.1% of all of those viruses. So I will turn you to my last point. The opportunity we have is to be transformative. Move beyond what are the agent-specific interventions, going after Ebola, going after yellow fever, and begin turning the sciences for emerging viral diseases from what are really low data sciences, almost mom and pop sciences, into big data. What would it take? First, in fact, go out and characterize those other 6,000 flavy viruses that are out there that are currently circulating in wildlife. What would it take for us to be able to go out and characterize the 6,000 um, filoviruses? The opportunity is extraordinary. We are not limited by technology. What we are limited by is political will. And we know from work that we've done in partnership with many in this room over the last decade, the feasibility of actually going out into wildlife, collecting those samples, beginning that characterization, both in terms of their genetic and their ecologic profiles, allow us to transform the sciences of emerging viral diseases from a small agent-specific science into broad spectrum, family level, virome level sciences. Final point, Albert Einstein famously observed that doing the same thing over and over again is the definition of madness. We're not mad, but we are simply, when we think about what's our plan B to plan A, we usually say, we'll do plan A better. What we're arguing for is to transform what we think about plan B and open up the gauge. Think about the role of this ecosystem we sit in, wildlife, livestock, and people, and use that understanding to begin to transform the questions we're asking and the investments we're making. Thank you.